Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this DECA Chambers Decanar uh, on the duty of care in professional indemnity claims and update. As promised, I said that we would wait until one minute past 12 to let people join. And I am gratified to see that quite a few people have now joined. So thank you very much and welcome. I'm Francesca O'Neill and I have with me, James Holmes Milner. Uh, we both do a lot of professional negligence work and quite frequently that involves advising our clients as to the extent of any duty of care owed by the professional in question, whether we are acting for that professional or whether we're acting for the claimant. So I hope this will be an interesting and informative talk. Um, we're going to be doing a, a general update because as you'll all be aware, it's been a really busy 12 months in the world of professional liability. There have been some quite important decisions, particularly um, those which have gone on to consider some of the aspects set out in the decision in MBS and Grant Thornton. But we're going to look at some older cases as well, so that those of you who might be new to this kind of work aren't completely lost um, and you have an idea of the background and the grounding required to understand why this issue is one that is so controversial and fraught and keeps on going to court. So we're going to look at the scope of a professional's duty. We're going to look at some decisions about when a retainer comes into being. So when you can imply a contract that was not expressed, was not obvious. Um, and then if there's time, and I do caveat if there's time, um, there are some slides towards the end which deal with a decision on contribution claims. It's an important decision, Percy and Merriman White. If I have time, I will talk about it a little bit, but even if I don't have time to talk about it, the slides are there to explain it to you. And so you should take account of that in your own time when the slides are emailed to you. Or I think, as it is common practice for a video, a recording, of the webinar to be uploaded to the DECA Chambers YouTube channel. So if you want to come back and re-watch any part of it, uh, you can, or if you want to send it or alert your colleagues to it, then it will be uploaded and it will be there for you to look at. I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, James, who's going to start with the starting point and a recent decision, Spire Property Development, LLP Withers, uh, because that's, I think, a really useful jumping off point an explanation of this topic. So over to you, James. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all. Um, I'm actually going to talk about two cases. SPA is a case about um, the informal duties that a solicitor will owe to the client after ostensibly the retainers come to an end. So tidying up after, as far as the solicitor is concerned, um, the retainers being performed, but often loose ends obviously need to be dealt with and tidied up. The second case is Miller and Owen Mitchell. Um, both of these cases were from last summer. And in that case, the issue is what duties arise before all the ingredients, the normal ingredients of a retainer have been entered into. In that, in that case, it was a CFA. Um, so what duties arose before the solicitor actually puts pen to paper and executes the CFA? Starting with Spire, um, this is uh, the slide in front of you, essentially shows the takeaway points from this judgment. It's a judgment of Lady Justice Carr, um, and the takeaway points appear in paragraphs 56 and 58 of her judgment, absolutely worth reading. Um, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a return to orthodoxy because you can argue that the, uh, the lay client in SPA on this point was, was pushing at the boundaries. The solicitor's duty is limited to carrying out the tasks which the client has instructed and which the solicitor has agreed to undertake. Well, that's the, the, the obvious uh, starting point in all of these cases. Um, the Court of Appeal reminded us that courts must be wary of imposing duties that go beyond the scope of what they've been requested to do. I'm going to give some examples of that that arise um, from the review of the authorities in the judgment. So we've really got to determine what are the duties which the solicitor has agreed to undertake and how far beyond what the parties have understood that solicitor is going to be responsible for dealing with, how far we push it. Um, a reminder that uh, 
implicit in the retainer is that the solicitor will advise on matters reasonably incidental to that. Uh, and all the circumstances of the case are going to have, going to, have to be taken into account. Um, as I said, Lady Justice Carr reviewed the authorities um, and, sorry, and uh, we begin with the case of Minsberg and Land Minkin, forgive me, and, and Landsberg. There's a very good summary of this case in Jackson and Powell. This was a case where the solicitor was asked to draft a matrimonial consent order. Um, at that point, the parties have reached settlement terms, and so all that the solicitor was being asked to do was draft an order that could be put before the court for approval. And inevitably, the fee that would have been charged for that task was uh, constrained by the limited scope of that retainer. It, it, in fact, the terms that had been agreed before that solicitor came on board uh, were such that uh, the, the lay client was unhappy and sought to blame the solicitor for drafting a consent order negligently and not advising her. Um, in that particular case, the court decided that the lay client was an intelligent woman who practiced as an accountant, and there was no duty for the solicitor to advise her on the merits of the settlement to give warnings to her as to its consequences. Obviously, the solicitor was a matrimonial finance expert, um, but nevertheless, the the fees that had been agreed and all the circumstances were clearly relevant in constraining the duties the solicitor had. Uh, the, the second authority, Credit Leonay and Russell Jones, um, we come up with the rotten tooth analogy. That was Lord Justice, uh, well, Mr. Justice Laddie, as he was then, um, with, with a rather colourful analogy. That was the case where uh, it, it was a property case, the client instructed the solicitor to ask to extend a, the, the time for which uh, a, a, the time by which a break uh, notice had to be exercised in order to terminate a lease um, what the solicitor the solicitor undertook that task but what the solicitor didn't do was tell the client that this was an all or nothing uh, deadline and if they didn't exercise their right to break the lease within that deadline, they were going to lose that right for good. And in that case, um, the solicitor lost. Denning and Greenhay was the case about the independent financial advisor who uh, was picking up the mess that a previous independent financial advisor had uh, created for the lay client. Um, the complaint that the lay client made there was that there was a duty for the new IFA to review and advise upon the advice given by the old IFA and uh, that argument was rejected and the, the principle established that only in obvious cases um, where there's a close and strong nexus with the retainer would the, that extended duty arise. So Lady Justice Carr reviewed those authorities and essentially as far as, far as, um, uh, as, far as most of us are concerned um, restored orthodoxy um, to the arguments that have been pushing at the boundaries of the scope of duty of care. Uh, and at the bottom bullet point on that slide, uh, she uh, made it clear that uh, none of the authorities that perhaps had suggested a more generous attitude to the scope of the duty um, were, were actually authorities for the proposition that a solicitor should carry out investigative tasks in areas that he or she hasn't been asked to deal with. However beneficial to the client, that might in fact have turned out to be. So um, just a little bit of information about the Spa case, because I, I, I've, I've essentially given you the takeaways and the review of the authority. What happened in that case was this. Uh, Spa bought two properties in Fulham, and uh, they were adjacent, they shared a boundary, and they wanted to carry out a development. Unfortunately, it turned out that there was a significantly sized electricity cable running through the back garden, which was going to impede the, the development dramatically. And uh, Spa sued with us. Essentially, there were two critical allegations of negligence. First of all, failing at the time of the conveyancing to identify the fact that there were cables underneath the properties. Uh, Spa won on that point, and that point wasn't the that was taken on appeal but the second particular negligence was uh was this after the transaction concluded spa wrote an email to Rithers 
asking some questions. And it was expressed in a rather informal manner. Um, it had three questions. Um, I'm not going to read it aloud. It's all there in the judgment for you. But it had three questions. But with this tag, this paragraph tagged on, we need to decide how we're going to approach UK power about this issue. So it would be very helpful to get your thoughts on the above. The better prepared we are, the more likely we will succeed in getting the cable moved. And what Spar argued was that that final paragraph in that email was an implicit request for advice about the rights or remedies they may have against the utility company, UK Power, in order to get them to move the cable. Um, and because the advice or the email response to that um, simply answered the three questions and didn't deal with that, they argued that they were entitled to rely on the email to uh, conclude that they didn't at that stage have any rights or remedies against UK Power. But of course, that argument uh, failed. The, the um, particular features, and, and, and it's a great illustration in this judgment, it's not a very long judgment either, of the, the detailed, dense, factual analysis that the court will undertake in order to answer the question whether the duty arises, because um, three particular points came out of those emails, the, that, the, the email questions and then the email responses. Firstly, that there was an implicit criticism of Withers in this, in the email that I just summarised to you, the one with the three questions. Um, and as uh, Lady Justice Carr put it, an objective interpretation of the communications was guarded and restrictive rather than open and expansive. So one shouldn't have read the answer as giving, uh, because of its omission, advice about a point that was only hinted at in the questions. Um, secondly, she said, although the developer's email raised the possibility uh, that they wanted to get the cables moved at somebody else's expense, winners were not explicitly asked to comment, let's still less advise on that. So that it was only the throwaway tag um to the end at the end of the email and then thirdly this is quite important and again it shows this the dense factual analysis is important the developers questions related to what had happened at the time of the purchase the queries raised and with his answers and this is quote had all been backward and not forward looking so there was it was essentially those inquiries were directed at what happened and why didn't we know at the time um and then uh, applying an objective test, the Court of Appeal on that second point that was uh, the only grounds of appeal, uh, the only plank for appeal on the, in respect to scope of duty, um, the Court concluded that Withers had not assumed responsibility for anything going beyond answering those three questions. So um, the case didn't just conclude on with that, uh, some other interesting points were, were, were raised. Um, Spar's uh, counsel had uh, argued that the subjective intention of the solicitor who was uh, handling that email and giving the answers to it is, is relevant. That was rejected. That's obviously a return to orthodoxy. Proper contractual principles apply here. You've got to be looking at the objective um, uh, look, taking an objective construction of, of what that exchange means and what was being asked of the, the solicitor and what duties it thereby undertook. And you'll, we'll come back to this because um, we'll see in the next case I'm going to talk about uh, Miller and Owen Mitchell that again this point was raised about this, what the client actually thought had been undertaken and agreed with the solicitor. Well that isn't actually going to be relevant. Um, the second bullet point on that page um, touches on something that uh, obviously is very important in this context. It's very frequent that we're going to find a case where there is actually no contractual relationship between the parties. And that in that case, if the client wants to establish a duty, they're going to have to fall back on a tortious duty, as Hedley, Byrne and Heller, and then all the cases following under that. Um, it's, it's fair to say that that issue and the scope of the duty that might apply in tort wasn't uh, part of the decision of the Court of Appeal, so it, it remains open for another day. Um, the other very important point, and, and then Francesca's going to obviously deal with this, MBS and Khan, 
uh, is the Court of Appeal made it clear that those authorities relate to the recoverability of damages. They're not uh, useful authorities for the court to determine the scope of the duty. Um, they are quite separate issues, and that's dealt with very helpfully in paragraph 71 of the judgment. And I do urge you to um, spend a bit of time. It's not the longest judgment. It really does repay um, reading. So that was the first case. So that's the case where, um, as far as the solicitor is concerned, the uh, retainer has been performed, and then we're looking at what, what subsequent duties might arise if the client asks further questions. The next case is Miller and Irwin Mitchell. And this was a case where um, the, the issue at stake is what was the scope, if anything, of a duty that arose before outwardly a retainer had been entered into. Client uh, had gone on holiday, she fell down some stairs, she injured her leg. She did um, she did notify that this was a case where they, they, they booked the holiday through a travel agent that, uh, as we're going to see, um, became insolvent. And she did tell that that travel agent had a local agent at the hotel where she was injured. She did inform the local agent that she'd fallen down the stairs, broken her leg and had to go to hospital. Um, a few days later, actually, when she was lying in the hospital bed, interestingly, um, I think back in the UK, um, she spotted the advert for the defendant's legal helpline and she was given a bit of um, basic advice um, and the, the file in the sense was opened and she was referred to the internal travel litigation group. Uh, it's important to, to bear this in mind because this was a very powerful um, factor in the decision that repeatedly Owen Mitchell asked her for documentation in order to assess whether they could accept her case and she was warned on several occasions that they couldn't protect her right to take legal action unless she was cooperative with them. Um, that, that, that was a particularly magnetic feature of the, of the judgment um, and uh, what essentially happened was that the insurance company for the travel agent repudiated liability um, for late notification and the travel agent itself uh, was liquidated so she had no other remedy than to try, try to uh, bring a claim against Erwin Mitchell. Essentially the claim that she intimated was uh, that they should have told her to inform the underlying defendant of the potential claim in time for them to have notified the insurance company so that that particular defence and repudiation of liability uh, wasn't going to be available to them. So two, two, two arguments. Uh, first of all, she argued that an express retainer had actually come into existence. Um, uh, she, she said that happened on one of a number of occasions. Firstly, she rather ambitiously argued that it happened when she first contacted the legal helpline. Um, well, of course, if you think through the process of that, uh, nobody was accepting that they would take on her case at that stage. All they did was handle it, take some information and refer it internally. And the judge um, said that it was just to borrow from the old formula from the contract law textbooks, no more than an invitation to treat. There was no, there was no binding in, co in a contractual setting. There was no binding consensus as to the terms of the fact of a retainer or the terms of the retainer. Um, secondly, though, she put a lot of emphasis on this, that once her case was referred to the internal travel group, they started recording time. Internally, it was actually recorded as work in progress. Um, they did give some advice. They went to counsel and, and it, uh, as well as that. Um, and she said, and they internally referred to as a client. But um, unremarkably, there was no agreement on the key issues. Basic contract law, there has to be a consensus on the necessary essential ingredients uh, within the retainer, and none of that applied on the facts of that, that case. Um, having, having argued that she had an express retainer, then she was forced to fall back on this argument about the, the, the second argument of an implied retainer. Um, the leading case on that uh, is relatively old now, Dean and Alan and Watts. Um, and 
A couple of important points, though, that, that come out of this that case and are reinforced in Miller and Irwin Mitchell. A, we've got the fact that we have to look at an, object, an objective analysis of the circumstances. Objectively, is there a consensus? And uh, then B, no such retainer should be applied for convenience, but only where an objective consideration of all the circumstances make it so clear um, an implication that the solicitor ought to have appreciated it. So we're looking at almost the contractual test for implied terms and necessity. Um, the third bullet point on that page is another very important point, and perhaps the second key point to come out of it. Parties' subjective intentions are relevant. Second key point is this third bullet point, which is this. The court will say, will ask itself, is the party's conduct consistent only with a retainer? Now, there, I, I started by telling you some background facts about the case, particularly the warnings given to the lay client by the solicitor about the consequences of her failure to communicate with them and cooperate. Uh, and the court said that those warnings are consistent with there being no retainer, they're certainly not consistent only with there being a retainer. Um, the judge wasn't that impressed with the fact that a file had been opened and billing time had been uh, effectively posted as work in, pro pro work in progress for the benefit of the client. There are lots of reasons why internally a, a solicitor will want to charge or at least work out what time has been expended on a file before a CFA has been entered into. Um, the short point here um, is that uh, there was a CFA, it was concluded, by then it was too late of course, but everything before that CFA was concluded was no more than preparatory to the entry into a retainer. And then uh, finally in this section uh, of my talk, um, she, uh, in, in the Miller case, argued that there was a tortious duty. Um, there's a helpful summary of the principles. Um, the judge essentially adopting the same reasons for rejecting the express retainer, rejected the concept of an implied retainer. Um, this case is going to the Court of Appeal. I believe it's before the Court of Appeal in October. Um, so, as the slide says, watch this space. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much for that, James. Very interesting uh, cases. I think Miller is a really interesting judgment, and I would urge you all to read the judgment because it does set out in some detail the factors that any court will take into account where there are arguments about either what was contained in an express retainer, if one had come into existence, alternatively, uh, all of the law on the implication of a retainer uh, and those cases are just going to be absolutely vital to anyone's understanding of this topic so we will have to watch what the court of appeal does with it uh, james and i have our own personal views about it but we'll have to wait until october if we're right don't we yes um, two other interesting cases on the implication of retainers that were decided in 2022. The first, McDonnell and Das Legal Solutions. Um, this was a really interesting case in terms of the law, because here we had a claimant who sought to argue that there was an implied retainer between himself and a firm of solicitors based on a conversation lasting only a few minutes. Of course, the broader context here is that he had been a client of this firm of solicitors for some years and was an experienced businessman who had done a lot of uh, land transactions in his time using this firm of solicitors to advise him and execute those land transactions. So the argument that he made was effectively, again, going back to that old uh, legal textbook, was based on a kind of course of dealing argument. He said, OK, Normally, when I do a land transaction with this firm of solicitors, we have an express retainer. Uh, in this case, we didn't have an express retainer, but we all knew full well that you were acting for me on it. And the solicitors said, uh, no, we weren't. You didn't instruct us formally. There was no retainer. You knew full well, Mr. McDonald, that in circumstances where you want us to act for you, there has to be one, as there had been in all of the previous land transactions on which we'd acted for you. Um, so it was a, a, a neat argument, I suppose. The uh, judge took a rather dim view of uh, Mr. McDonald's assertions, 
And again, it was a return to orthodoxy because what she said was where there is no express retainer, an implied retainer can only come into existence if the test for implication of terms is met. Uh, the test is one of necessity. And in this case, it was not necessary for a retainer to be implied, although of course, with the benefit of hindsight, Mr. MacDonald rather wishes that it could have been. A retainer will not be implied just because it was convenient to Mr. MacDonald or to any party in his situation. And the fact that there was no express retainer was in fact powerful evidence in support of the argument that there was no implied retainer either. The judge quite fairly, in my view, said, well, if Mr. MacDonald had wanted that legal solutions to act for him in this particular land transaction, he would have done what he had done countless times before, and he would have entered into a formal retainer with them. The fact that he didn't means that he didn't want to pay them to act for him in this particular transaction. So when it all went pear-shaped, he couldn't then turn around and blame them. That seems to me the right approach, the right decision. And again, although it is a fairly lengthy judgment, it is worth uh, reading really for the warning to claimants in situations such as the one that Mr. McDonald found himself in, uh, that you, know, you, you might have uh, come out the worse for a business decision but don't go and blame your lawyers whom you had not instructed to advise you on it later on. The other interesting decision, and again, it's, it's similar in some respects to the McDonald decision, is one in Orion Real Estate and Mishkondorea. Um, in this judgment, the judge really rather robustly rejected the claimant's analysis that there could be implied a general retainer to imply all the legal advice necessary to successfully conclude a dispute which surrounded the removal of sitting tenants from a property. What Mishkondorea had actually agreed to do was to advise Orion Real Estate on a matter by matter basis by the use of engagement letters. So for each piece of advice that Orion Real Estate required, they had to engage their lawyers with a new engagement letter which said and now we'd like advice on this and Mish Kondorea would turn around and say it will cost you this amount of money and will take us you know this number of hours to advise you on this and each time there was a new step a new piece of advice sought that to be a new letter that did not give rise to a general retainer of any sort to give advice that was not expressly requested by way of an engagement letter and if one read those letters fairly and objectively and having regard to the circumstances in which the letters were agreed and of course the whole purpose of having letters in this way and advice on a matter by matter basis is to reduce cost it's so that you don't pay for a general retainer you only pay for the specific advice that you require um, there was clearly an agreement which envisaged a continuum of of drafting and negotiation between the law firm and the sitting tenants who were in the property uh, which Orion Real Estate wanted them out of. And therefore, without that continuum of drafting and negotiation, uh, there could be no general retainer. So the advice that was the subject of the complaint was outside of the scope of the engagement letter in place at the time, and therefore Orion Real Estate had no recourse. The other argument that was then put forward, which I think is quite interesting, is that, well, OK, there was no general retainer, but the scope of the advice that we sought in the letter had been expanded by subsequent instructions. We'd communicated on various occasions about it. We'd explained what we wanted. Ms. Condorea had responded uh, and they said if the only contract in existence was the engagement letter, uh, then we varied that contract. And again, it's the standard test for variation of contracts. The focus is on the party's intention determined objectively. And really, the question is whether the suggested variation went to the very root of the contract with some very old but good law cited in the judgment in support of the judge's conclusion that there was no duty of care and no variation. The judgment, again, worth reading for paragraphs 33, 69, 98 and 106 as a discussion of the scope of duty of care, applying the rather complicated duty nexus uh, steps that were set out in the six stage test in MBS uh, and Grant Thornton, that's the Kahn and Meadows Supreme 
Supreme Court decision, which I think was uh, intended to clarify matters and to assist practitioners as to whether or not uh, a duty of care might arise in certain situations, but I think has actually confused matters uh, even more. Uh, and so I don't think it's resolved things at all. I think it's added to the confusion. Uh, but do have a look at those paragraphs because they do give some guidance on the approach that courts will take where the duty nexus question in particular is a live one. Uh, I wanted to talk a little about a case that I was involved in. This was a two day trial which took place in March of last year. And the reason that I wanted to talk to you about it is because these kinds of questions, they may arise in high value, important cases which go to the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. But actually, in your day to day practices, these kinds of questions arise all the time. Harry and Curtis law uh, is a conveyancing negligence case. It's unreported. It's a decision of his honour Judge Mitchell. There is a useful summary of it in a Law Gazette article which came out uh, about it shortly after the decision. And a couple of legal academics have written about it in the context of Academic consideration of the scope of duty because, um, surprisingly, these issues don't go to trial that often in the lower courts and the county courts um, because insurers are often quite reluctant to run things to trial where there is litigation risk. And of course, any lawyer will advise their client that there is always considerable litigation risk in going to trial on anything. Nonetheless, this one did go to trial, um, and it's a useful decision for defendants who are concerned when faced with allegations that they should have, particularly in conveyancing cases, or are, I think in low value fixed fee personal injury cases, that they ought to have gone uh, further than strictly necessary in considering relevant factors. There was a conveyancing negligence case, as I've said, Solicitors acted on a low fixed fee conveyancing package. I think it was £750 plus VAT for the whole thing. The scope of the written retainer promised to investigate title, form searches, so on and so forth, as usual, totally standard. All of that was done, and the results of the local searches did not give detail of any major road scheme within 200 metres of the house. In fact, it turned out that that search result was wrong. Uh, it was wrong because the Forder Valley Link Road, which was a fairly major new road development linking two parts of Plymouth, was to be constructed along a route running past the end of the road on which the claimant's house was situated. So this was a fairly major road that was going to be built less than 50 metres from her house. And she came to court complaining that instead of buying a quiet house on a quiet small street surrounded by other quiet, small, unbusy streets, she was now going to be faced with bus traffic and other, you know, fairly sizable numbers of cars uh, traveling from one part of Plymouth to another, effectively rumbling past the front of her house. The judgment considered the extent to which solicitors taking on this kind of large volume, low cost work can limit the scope of their retainer. Uh, was it necessary for the conveyances in this case to go beyond the answer that they received to the question in the search on the, on the construction of, of roadways, um, to go behind that, to go further? And the judge said, no, uh, you had the answer. It didn't raise any concerns. You didn't need to go any further. And the basis for that was that paying less or even nothing for a professional service does not alter the standard of the work that must be completed. Again, you can look at the case on that. The case, it's an interesting one, actually, Burgess and Lejeanvan, I remember when this came out uh, in 2017, uh, Mrs. Lejeanvan was a uh, landscape gardener who had offered to do some work for free for some friends. She completed the work. They weren't happy with it, and sued her in professional negligence. Um, she probably uh, was quite disgruntled uh, to be sued in that way. But what the court said in that was just because uh, you completed it for free, didn't mean that you could do it badly. So the standard of the care that is required when offering a professional service is not affected by the amount that's paid for it. Uh, but in this case, it was successfully argued that the low fee and strict limitation of the retainer circumscribed the work that had to be done following uh, some of the older accountancy cases, again from 2017. Solicitors 
were entitled to rely on the results of the searches, which didn't raise any particular concern and distinguished the, uh, what the Court of Appeal said in Orient Field Holdings, where uh, in that case, uh, the purchasers wished to buy a £25 million house in, in St John's Wood in central London and weren't told that a special needs school was going to be constructed right next door and they sued their solicitors for not alerting them to the fact. And the judge in that case said, well, um, you were probably paying your solicitors uh, not a low fixed fee retainer to act for you in the purchase of a really substantial property. And there were things in the answers to the property searches which ought to have raised alarm bells. And in those circumstances, there was a requirement to go behind the answers to the searches and have a closer look. Uh, but in my case, uh, that simply wasn't the case. The answer was crystal clear. There was nothing odd about it. Uh, and the fact that you had agreed to do searches and to report on the answers within the retainer uh, meant that you could so successfully argue that there was a limitation which meant that you didn't need to go beyond it. I put there the link um, to the Law Gazette article if anyone is interested in going beyond it. Now, I am looking at my watch because we don't have very much time and I don't want to go beyond, I know most of you are tuning in on your lunch break. I did want to just alert you all though, Percy and Merriman White is an important decision for practitioners. Um, again, I think it can be termed, I think this is what James said to me before, it is again a bit of a return to all orthodoxy because the High Court decision in Percy and Merriman White was quite astounding. I'll run through it very quickly in a couple of minutes, but do take some time afterwards to familiarise yourself with it. Um, in this case, uh, Mr Percy sued his solicitors, Merriman White, and his barrister, Mr Mayfield, for various losses. The background is not important. Mr Percy ultimately proceeds by discontinuing his claim against Mr. Mayall, and he settled his claim after negotiations with Merriman White for a quarter of a million pounds. And Merriman White then turned round to Mr. Mayall, the barrister, saying, well, we relied on some advice that you gave us, and so we want a contribution from him. And this is the important part. Um, you can't turn around to us and say that we ought not to have settled the claim with Mr. Percy. Uh, you need to effectively uh, cough up. You don't have the ability to really defend yourself. Um, and the reason that they were able to say this is because if a contribution claimant enters into a bona fide settlement in respect of a claim which, on its alleged facts, displayed a genuine cause of action against him, the contribution defendant, so Mr. Mayall, cannot argue that the underlying claim against the contribution claimant was wrong. And Merriman White relied well, section 14 of the Civil Liability Contribution Act 1978. But they went a little further than that. They said that Mr. Mayall could not dispute his own liability either. And they relied on paragraph 59 of a decision, again, a 2017 decision, uh, WH Newson Holding Limited, uh, to say that really Mr. Mayall uh, couldn't even dispute uh, the fact that he might have regarded his own advice to Merriman White as being entirely sound and that none of the losses that Mr. Percy suffered were anything to do with him. Um, and this went to trial and the High Court agreed with Merriman White, which I think is quite astounding. But anyway, unsurprisingly, the Court of Appeal reversed that decision. And the reason they reversed it is because of what Mr. Lord Justice Lewison said. He said, well, if Mr. Mayall's liability were to be conclusively determined against him by a settlement made between Mr. Percy and Mr. Mer uh, and Mrs. Merriman White um, without any determination by a court, and without his involvement, that would, on the face of it, deprive him of his right to have his liability determined by an independent and impartial tribunal. And it would be a breach of his Article 6 right to a fair trial. It's perfectly OK for Merriman and White to have their own liability determined by way of negotiation and the settlement, uh, because it's always open to a party to waive its rights under Article 6. But Mr. Mayall was never given that opportunity and he never waived his rights under Article 6, and therefore he had to have the opportunity to defend himself. So this is now clear authority, I say, for the proposition that in contribution proceedings, whilst a contribution defendant cannot in general challenge the contribution claimant's liability to the underlying claimant, provided that the contribution claimant would have been liable 
if the facts alleged by the underlying claimant were proved against him, the contribution defendant can dispute his own liability, just as he would have been able to in any underlying proceedings. So, for example, if Mr Percy had not discontinued and had not settled, but had in fact fought his claim against both of them to trial, um, he ought to be in the same position as if that had happened. Um, and I think that is an important authority. And again, I'm going to restate it, a return to orthodoxy in the way that contribution um, claims are handled by the courts. That is the end of the slideshow. Uh, we are very happy to answer questions. I believe there was one question sent in advance, uh, which James is going to deal with, which was, which was a Percy and Merriman White question. Yeah, it was a question from Ryan, which was, uh, essentially this, whether we think Percy and Merriman will impact in particular on abuse claims. Um, because as Francesca points out, we think it's just a return to orthodoxy. The answer to that we think is no. Um, in, most, in most abuse cases, I would imagine that if there's been a, a settlement by a contribution claimant, we're looking probably at an insured professional body or professional agency that set the claim um, and then wants to recover a contribution from the perpetrator um, the, the, the principle applies I mean in many cases as we know the perpetrator may well have been prosecuted and there'll be a criminal conviction but mm. that might not be the case in every, in every situation but it remains the case that the contribution defendant has the right uh, to a fair trial as uh, uh, Percy and Merriman establishes so I don't think it's going to make we don't think it's going to make any any particular any particularly difference. significant difference the reason for all of the um slideshow drama just now is because I just wanted to see whether anyone had put any questions in the webinar chat um can I just reiterate Emma's warning to you all not to click on the link I mean I'm glad to see that we are so popular that we're actually the target of spammers um but I don't see any other questions in the webinar chat or anywhere else. Um, does anyone have any questions for either James or I arising out of any of the topics we've covered today? If you don't right now and you, something occurs to you later on and you want to pick our brains, um, our email addresses are on the last slide. So please do feel free to email either one of us with any questions you have. We are hopefully able uh, to deal with any of those, but if there are no other questions, then thank you all very much for joining us. I hope that this has been an interesting and informative talk. We've tried very hard uh, to keep to time. Oh, OK, no, that's just a thank you. Thank you very much to you, uh, you. for joining us and uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Afternoon.